darkness you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only God. And great are you, Lord. You guys help us sing it. You give life. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Hey, Freedom family and friends, this is Pastor Larry. It is Thursday, July the 22nd. Hope that you're having a good week so far and hope you're staying encouraged in the Lord. So come on in, join me, and... Um, Let's get ready to study the Bible. We're in Romans chapter 13 today. And uh, while you're coming on in and uh, participating, why don't you go ahead and hit that like button? That's right. Hit that button. 
Mash that button. Don't forget to share and comment along the way. And as you do that, would love to hear about any prayer requests that you may have. And uh, maybe it's personal. Maybe it's about a family member. Maybe it's about a coworker or a friend. Uh, whatever the case may be, maybe it's about a job and uh, or whatever. We'd love to hear from you. So feel free to um, type that right into the comments all through the Bible study today. And uh, I'll check on that and respond to you the best way that I can and just let you know, give you a thumbs up, let you know I'm praying for you. Hey, I hope that, uh, as I said at the beginning, you're having a good week and hope you're planning, you know, Friday brings in the weekend. And I hope that you're already planning on being at church. That's right. Got to say that, of course, because we as believers, we ought to be in church, gathering together collectively to worship our King, but also to encourage one another and find encouragement through the Word and grow through the Bible. And so I hope that you're planning either to join us at 1030 on campus for our weekend celebration service or join us online at 1030 for our weekend celebration. Either way, we're glad that you're a part of this. And many of you are new to all of this, and I want to give a shout out to you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for participating. And thank you for allowing us the opportunity to just come into your life, into your space, and encourage you for the moment. Uh, through the Word of God. So glad that you're here, and I am so thankful. Hey, do you have your cup of coffee? You got your Bible? Again, we're going to be in Romans chapter 13, going to start a new chapter. Looking forward to that. And by the way, I have a special guest today right here in the studio with me. have a special guest with me, and he is going to say, hey, it's my son, Peyton, and uh, so he's in the studio with me uh, learning a little bit about some of this technology and all that it takes uh, kind of to just bring this to you, but uh, he's hanging out with Dad. Uh, we got some work to do around the church, and uh, as far as landscape and trees and all that, but he's here and uh, wanted to be in the studio here kind of learning a little bit, so he's with us today, so I'm glad that my son's here, but I'm glad that you're here as well, so Romans chapter 13. Have you found that yet in your Bible? Take a minute, get that. Some of you are at lunch. I respect your time. And uh, so thankful that many of you, um, you know, you come back and check this out when it's a little bit easier, convenient for you because you can't do it while you're at work. Maybe you're tied up during the day and um, you catch this. It's really not lunch with Pastor Larry. It's dinner with Pastor Larry. Or uh, some of you are putting late lunch um, with uh, Pastor Larry. I don't know if it's really a late lunch if it's around six or seven o'clock for you, but maybe you, I don't know, work third shift or uh, whatever, or second shift, and maybe it is a lunch time for you. But either way, hey, great job on encouraging yourself and investing in yourself uh, through the Word of God. So, so proud of you. Hey, let's dive right in if we can. Romans chapter chapter 13. I'm so thankful to start a new part of this. And uh, some of these folks are saying, hey, to you, Peyton, and uh, they're kind of typing into the comments and uh, saying, hey, to you. So, uh, hey, to my son, thanks for doing that. But Romans chapter 13, if we can plug into that for just a moment. Hey, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. I'm going to read all seven verses, and then we're going to dissect them as we always do and have done through all uh, the chapters here. We uh, read the verses and then we go back to them and give comments to them as we start to um, expository, give some uh, exposition on each verse. And so the whole thought now is Paul is teaching in Romans chapter 13, you know, he's been talking about a lot of relationships, but now he's going to deal with one that is a pretty sensitive subject in our society, always has been, and is probably even more so today. And what is our relationship to government? How do we respond? I mean, if you bring up politics or government, in any circle um, around you and people that are around you, often you, well, you get all kinds of thoughts and opinions, even from Christians. But here's the thing. God's word doesn't leave us um, empty 
or kind of floundering on our own, wanting to figure out what we should do or how we should respond. God has a lot to say about the government, actually, and I think it would be good for us to learn about that. And let me give a disclaimer up front, and that is God is never and will never because it would be contrary to his character to ask or require you or I to do something that is contrary to his word. That is not uh, biblical, and it's not the Christian life. So there are times, obviously, when things are in direct opposition to government and what they're doing. We as Christians should stand up against that. For instance, like abortion. We are highly sensitive about that um, because we believe that birth or life begins, excuse me, at conception. And yes, we believe in the life of the unborn child. We also believe in the life of the woman. But we also want to make sure that we're clear that there is grace and forgiveness when um, maybe a woman, a lady has entered into this decision unknowingly or before they were saved. And there is forgiveness. Yes. So there's no hate among this. However, we as Christians do not give a thumbs up or approval to that kind of legislation and legalization um, of murdering babies, um, we do not stand for that because we know it's an opposition of the Word of God. However, a lot of times people take a hard stand or a uneducated stand against the government about everything, everything. And we're going to cover a few of those things through this because we want to learn and we want to grow and we want to be sensitive about the needs and opinions and places where other people are in our society. Yet at the same time, we want to do this. We always want to land on a biblical approach. And What that means, there's no hate in that. A biblical approach doesn't leave you at the place of hate and anger and lashing out and hurting or destroying others in the process. No, no, no. We take a biblical approach and land on the truth, and that's where we leave it. And so Paul here starts with, and verse 1 is a big one of Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Check that out. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. Mm. That's important. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, consequences, condemnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works. Check that out. But to evil. Then why are they there? They're there to thwart evil, to combat evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. No need to fear something. When you are obeying and doing what's right, no need to get nervous when the police officer or state trooper is behind you when you're driving the speed limit, right? But boy, does our palms get sweaty and we start to get nervous when we see them. Well, there's no need when we are doing what's right. Look at verse 4. For he is the minister talking about those in authority is the minister of God to thee for good. There are people in power and authority for good, God says. But if thou do that which is evil, here's the warning. Be afraid. Don't be afraid if you're doing good, but be afraid if you're not doing good. For he beareth not the sword in vain. That's pretty strong language. There's a reason that they're able to implement uh, certain disciplines and consequences 
to breaking the law, for he is the minister of God. Wow. This is very important language. This means this person is under the authority of God and is being used for a purpose that God sees fit. Notice the end of verse 4, a revenger to execute wrath upon the good citizens, upon the good people, upon the law-abiding citizens. No, that is not what it says. It says to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. It's important for them to be able to carry out the judicial system and the law and be able to do it effectively to discourage others from breaking the law. Look at verse 5. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. This is good for us to be reminded of this, that in our thoughts, we ought to desire to do well and to do good. So therefore, our actions follow that because we're not wanting wrath. So our thinking is, man, I don't want to break the law because I know when breaking the law, there comes consequences and I don't want that. That's good. That is good. Verse six, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attend continually upon this very thing. We give honor and we pay our taxes. We do things. And we'll talk about this, why this is important and why should Christians do what's right by the law? And, you know, there are people who will take some strong stances here uh, on both sides. But I think there's a biblical balance here of what God is saying and the reason he is letting us know and instructing us this through the Apostle Paul. Then verse 7, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due right? Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So if they deserve honor, we did give that. If they need to be feared, we should do that. And this means in a respectful, correct manner. This doesn't mean in a cowardly manner. Um, this means, hey, whatever is customary in that environment. Look, when you go to foreign countries, even like, um, England, you drive on the other side of the road and your steering wheel is on the other side of the car. You can complain and toot your horn. Well, that's not how I drive in America. It doesn't matter. This is what they require. The street signs are different. The stoplights are different and located in different places. So there are just things that we should follow and do because they are for our benefit. So when we've been studying the book of Romans, the apostle Paul has taken us from law to grace, right? He's taken us from wrath to glory. He's also taken us to the um, realization of how we as a body of believers, the church should act together, how we serve together and what our function is together. But he's also dealt with relationships. In the words, how we should treat one another. How should we respond to one another? What is it that we should do in, as we just learned, living peaceably among all men as much as lieth within you? That's what Paul said. This is what God's word is to us. And so Paul is dealing with a lot of issues. And then we run into Romans chapter 13. And now it's dealing with the subject of the Christian, and the government. And so it's amazing to me that Christians are not really aware or could neglect, maybe. So if they are aware, then it's negligence or disobedience. Maybe some aren't aware of the power and the significance of verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. It says the powers that be are ordained of God. They are there for a purpose so that ultimately there's no power but of God. So we, we've got to realize that these are in place as God saw fit, and there is reasoning behind it. 
And I already know what some may be thinking. Well, pastor, I'm, I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. So don't place the law on me. And I hear you, but I don't believe that's our best. I don't believe that's Christ honoring because it is true that we are under the dispensation of grace. I hear you. And that is true, but that is not to the neglecting or negating of the human government that we are under. So, yeah, we're under the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 4. Check this out. This is where we are. This is where we live. For this reason, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So he's our apostle. You may have heard of the administration of the grace of God, which is given me for you. So God has revealed certain things to me to give to you. And that's what I'm doing. Verse three, he says, how by revelation, that means revealing He made known to me the mystery, as I have written briefly already. So the mystery, what mystery? It's not a mystery any longer because we know that because it's been revealed. So therefore, that removes it being a mystery. But it was the mystery of the grace of God and how God is going to deal not with the nations now, but on an individual basis. Verse 4 of Ephesians 3, by which when you read it, You may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So, yeah, we are living under um, grace and we're under that dispensation, but we're also under the dispensation of human government. And this government of human government, do you know that it was established in Noah's day? Yeah, it goes all the way back to Genesis So Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Check this out. Genesis 9, verse 5 and 6. This goes all the way back to the beginning. But for your own lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. Okay? For every animal will I require it of man too. Will I require a reckoning for human life of every man that is? of his fellow man. What is he saying? He is saying something very clearly, but if you haven't caught on, then verse 6 of Genesis 9 lets us know. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So it's clearly letting us know that We are responsible for the life of every individual. That's right. We are responsible how we treat others and how the life of other people are essential. They are. And Paul's, um, I mean, in Genesis here, we're reading that Abraham wrote, okay, Moses, excuse me, not Abraham. I said, I said, Abraham, it's Moses that whoever sheds man's blood shall his blood be shed. So what does this mean? This makes us responsible even to, here's the thing, we don't like this word, capital punishment, and this includes all lesser penalties. Now here's the thing, it's important for us to realize why government and authority is in place. And when Paul said, powers that be are God ordained. That's what he said. This really gives us exactly the kind of rulers that God wants us to have or that we deserve. See, some of these rulers are wicked and immoral. So you didn't think I was going to cover that, but the fact is not all government is good. Okay. Not all politicians, not all legislation uh, by mankind is good. I know that. And that's because it's being based off of men and they've left their original design and authority that God has set in place because Paul said ordained of God. And here's the thing. That means we're responsible to God. This is important. Not all authority, government authority, do we agree with? Of course not, because it goes against what we believe as Christians. However, 
there are some foolish thoughts that go on in the society today in the world. And it's amazing to me what some will take a hard stand on, a foolish stand on, only to cry something different when they realize or need that authority back in their life or around them. And so God lets us know, look, there's a reason why things are in place like they are. They are for your betterment. See, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, this is so important. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, listen to this this writer, Daniel, listen to this prophet here. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he wills and sets up over it the basest of men. So Daniel even says, look, the reason that there's authority in place is because this is what God wanted and has desired. And Daniel says something strong to the pagan and arrogant, the king in his day was Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. He said, the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, God hath given you power and strength and glory. So you know what he says to the king? You wouldn't be where you are unless God allowed it. God's the one who gave you strength, gave you this kingdom, gave you power. He's reminding him as he is to us. Of course, Daniel didn't agree with all of King Nebuchadnezzar's decrees and appointments. Of course, we don't agree with all of our human government. Absolutely not. Emphatically not. However, there are a lot of benefits to our government, and there are a lot of reasons that it is established. Yet, King Nebuchadnezzar, in his pride and in his arrogance, Do you realize that a voice came from heaven that condemned him to insanity? Why? To teach him a lesson. It's amazing when people rise to power and fame, and when they abuse it, how often they fall and crumble, and many of them go bonkers. Their mind becomes so corrupt and so greedy that they literally start to lose their mind and they fall. There's a reason for that. And Daniel said in Daniel 4, verse 32, the most high, talking about God, ruleth the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomever he will. Do you remember the words of Jesus to Pilate? Do you remember what he said to Pilate himself when he stood before Pilate, when there was all kinds of false accusations and there was a mockery of a trial? He said to Pilate, thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given to thee from above. He said this right to Pilate's face because it's true. Do you know six times, six times in Romans chapter 13, which we're in, verses 1 through 7, six times in this little brief passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul declares that the government over us is ordained by God. Six times. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you believe everything and that you say yes to everything. Of course not, especially when it's diametrically opposite or in contrast to the Word of God. 
However, when people make really ridiculous statements about the government or just really always have an ax to grind, always raising the flag up the pole against the government, We need to put the square wheels on for just a moment because not all of it is bad, okay? God has placed them in position and placed this government authority structure, if you will, in place for our betterment. After all, although I don't agree with everything, of course, and neither do you, It's better than ultimate chaos. Do you realize what would happen if all of government was removed? Not only would there be a socialistic government, not democracy. There would be anarchy and chaos. Ultimate, talking about bloodshed. That's right. So think about that. Before we just write off everything, we need, as one prophet said, nobody would sit down, no one would build a building, no one would do that without first sitting down and counting the cost. My friend, there is a cost. I I don't know who wrote the song. I don't know where it came from. This is the only part of the song I know and remember So I can't give credit to it. I don't even know if the whole song is good or bad, but this is one line that says, I fought the law and the law won. I fought the law and the law won. It is foolish to fight the law when you are living good and not living in evil. That's the warning that Paul gives us. Why fear the law if I'm not living evil? I don't have to worry about being arrested at Walmart. Why? I'm not shoplifting. I don't have to worry about um, my house being raided because I have nothing there that is illegal and I haven't done anything that's broken the law. I don't have to worry about them showing up at my house. See, you can do well in society and live well when we understand the environment that we're in and why it is there. See, earthly rulers, I get it, can be oppressive, they can be corrupt, they can be arbitrary, I get that, but God says be subject as he directs even a wife to a husband or children to their parents. Or th- this is the reason, like, we give honor, we we give subject, we give reverence, and abuse of authority, though, does not change the fact of what God says. Do we decry abuse of authority? Absolutely. We do not stand for that. However, you don't. Take out the whole thing. You know the old phrase, throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Oh, well, let's make sure. We we don't just decry and, you know, just dismiss everything because one thing is bad. Look, there are sometimes bad service at a restaurant. Okay, I get it. Sometimes the food's not that great. That doesn't stop you from going out to eat, does it? So because you got one bad meal or one bad sir, you've stopped eating? No. No one takes that approach. No one would do that. But, oh, you got a bad car. Oh, don't ever buy this certain model of a car because I had an experience. Okay, because you had a bad experience, does that mean we should never buy another car? Or that all the cars by that maker are bad? No. But boy, we're quick to draw these lines, aren't we? We're quick to even draw the lines with each other. Okay? Someone treats us bad, responds in a bad way. Now everyone's that way. Everyone. No. 
Maybe the communication was just bad. Maybe we say the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's okay. Look, I get it. But not everybody is bad, and we don't have to constantly live in that state. So God has established this. Why? So the world would have order and not chaos. Yeah. Can you imagine the chaos if there was no legal authority in place, if there was no police, no authority, no National Guard, no military, n- nothing, no one that implements or carries out breaking of the law, that there's, there's no enforcing of the law. Can you imagine what Walmart would be right now? Well, you just take whatever you want. Why? Well, because stealing's not a crime. And by the way, if you steal it, no one's going to arrest you. That's foolishness. Of course they're going to arrest you, and they should, because you broke the law. Can you imagine? And that's just the most simplest of things. But God has done this for our betterment. And this is not really a popular philosophy of the day. I get it. We are in such dislike of the government, okay? And it doesn't even matter who's in office, you know? Four years ago, it was the same way. Prior to that, same way. Every time, there's always this. But as a Christian, we need to make sure that we are understanding God's word for us. And so the affirmation is that we're only to be responsible or to obey what's reasonable, okay? And this isn't, This isn't really subject to our interpretation, no. Because if it's subject to our interpretation of only obeying what's reasonable, then the philosophy will drive society to anarchy. And haven't you already seen that? This is why we got to have something in place. This is why we've got to have some guidelines. Do you know Peter confirmed what Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 13? Peter confirmed this of what God's word says about the very subject. And Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says this, Submit yourselves, this is Peter, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme, Verse 14, or to unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. This is exactly what Paul is saying to you and I today. And this principle is stated both negatively and positively Uh, In verse 2 of Romans 13, so Peter is saying the same thing, but we often don't want to deal with these verses or overlook these verses when we are in such disagreement with what's happening in our world. And by the way, there is a lot of bad things happening. We don't agree with that. But at the same time, what does that got to do with the speed limit? What does that have to do with day-to-day crime? We still have laws that we should obey and do what's right because it is for our betterment. Paul said in Romans 13, verse 2, could I draw your attention there just briefly? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, condemnation, consequence. Here's the thing. Lawlessness, iniquity leads to consequences. Why do people riot and tear up stuff? Because they're mad and they have a right to. No, no. Businesses being destroyed, okay? People's vehicles, homes, people's lives being taken because someone got upset. Yeah. They should be upset about certain atrocities. However, to go out and do another wrong, what does that say? That's it. Basically, you nullify your your protest. 
And it's against the law. And it's wrong. And anarchy happens. And it's allowed. This is why God put these things in place. God says, hey, look, okay, you don't agree with what's happening? Good. Okay, we get it. But that doesn't make you right. Two wrongs don't make it right. So now you're going to get punished. Uh, They're going to get punished, okay, if the law and the process should be carried out and carried out appropriately. But, But now you're doing it. And it just goes against what the Word of God is saying. And so even Paul said this in 2 Thessalonians as I close. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 verse 7, he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already working. Only he who is now restraining him will do so until he is taken out of the way. Look, there's going to be lawlessness always. Until God deems necessary to institute his kingdom, pour out his wrath, and establish a new heaven and a new earth. So what is in place now before that authority to keep this under wraps? There's always going to be lawbreakers. What do you do with them? You have to punish them. There has to be a punishment. There has to be something to keep others from following the same suit. And this is why Paul makes such an incredible statement. Remember in verse one of Romans 13, as I close, he says, let us all be subject unto higher powers for there's no power, but of God and the powers that are be are ordained of God. Look, the fact is there's a lot of things that people are saying today. We'll talk about this next week. And yet, even before they get the words out of their mouth, they live with such hypocrisy because the very thing that they're saying, they know doesn't make sense and they truly don't want it. But they're saying it either to be popular, maybe to get votes or to gain support of uh, the population. The fact is, it's actually more destruction. It's going to lead to a greater demise. If we would just look to the Bible and realize, okay, there's there's a reason why police are where they are. You know, there's a reason why we pay our taxes because we like the firemen to show up. The firemen are paid by our taxes. That's how they get paid. That money from the city and from even the counties that have to do fundraising and that show up to your house, um, the rescue squads, guess where they are funded from? So you render... You, you give honor to whom honor is due. You, you pay, you give rendering of those taxes to those individuals. To remove all of that, any of that, would absolutely be insanity. And there's a reason why God has written his word so we could help be governed and understand and be guided, right? for our benefit. They're they're not to listen God's book is not just to it's not to oppress you. If that's what that's not. I mean Paul says stand fast in the liberty where Christ has set you free. That's Galatians. Well, oppression, liberty, they are opposite. This is not what God is doing. He's doing it for protection for your health and for the betterment of society. But when man does what they do under their own subjectiveness and ideology and their own philosophy, they corrupt it. See, what Satan meant for evil, God means for good. God actually has a purpose. And we need to look to God's word. So don't be discouraged by what your government does do or doesn't do. Take it in through the lens of the scriptures. And yes, as a believer, stand against those things that are opposite and contrary to the word of God. But those other things, we can apply grace and steal this thought, you know, without it, without anything, because there's no stop. Once you start removing certain things, um, 
then where does it end? Where does it stop? And so removing any of that and all of that is actually not for our good. It'll actually be for more destruction and more bloodshed. And society will become a society of anarchy and not as God is, who is a God of decency and of order. So I want to thank you for joining me today. You are loved. You are prayed for. And again, I hope that you're joining us for our weekend celebration service at 1030 on campus. That's right, face-to-face. Or um, join us for our church online family. So glad that you're here. Thanks for inviting. Thanks for commenting. Hey, if you have any prayer requests, you can feel free to share that. But until next time, hope that you'll join me and uh, join me right here. And I look forward to being with you as we continue to study through the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13, encouraging ourselves and getting stronger in the word of God as we root and ground ourselves in the word that God has for us today. God bless you. See you next time.